Lena? I've got some visuals today. So um, I find myself that pictures really do paint a thousand words or tell you a thousand words. And so I've got visuals to go with what I'm doing today. And I trust that that will help us to allow the Holy Spirit to put his word into our heart this morning, both here and on Zoomers. So I'm sure that will help to make an impression even for the children. And uh, so we shall carry on. Now, before we go to the first one, before we go to the first one, I'll just... Um, get ready and set up here. Yeah, hallelujah. Yes, thank you, Jesus. So this message began on the 3rd of January, Sunday the 3rd of January this year. Three days into this year, I asked the Lord, Lord, Please show me what you're doing this year. And immediately, I mean immediately, just out in front of me, a vision occurred, an open vision of a Jewish temple and the curtain, the, the Jewish veil was being torn from top to bottom. And he said, this year, I'm unveiling my people more than ever before. This is a year of my unveiling. So today we're going to look at veils and we're going to agree with the Holy Spirit to lift off those veils that don't belong to us anymore. Who knows, we're in a different kingdom now. The old has passed away. All things have become what? New. So the, there's a saying going around with the pandemic stuff, this is a new normal. But I tell you, we've got the Calvary normal. That's our normal. And that's our eternal normal. So that's our normal. So could we have image one, please, Evelina? See how they go. Not, yeah, it's not too bad. So that's not the actual vision I saw, of course, because I'm not that good an illustrator. But there you see the temple veil torn into from top to bottom. And the artistic person that presented this um, they have just put the cross back there to make it even more uh, relevant. So I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 27, and I'd ask that you just keep looking at that. As you hear the word, look at the word too coming into you. So Matthew 27 from verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them rang, ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, I want you to think about this, the power of the, the voice of Jesus and the finished work that he did. I believe his last words where it is finished, and he breathed his last, depending on what gospel we're in. But when he shouted this time, just listen. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, not crushed, not broken. They were split. That's the power of our God, our Saviour. Excuse me. <laughs> And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, 
they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were there guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly. I think I'd be afraid too, wouldn't you? <laughs> they feared greatly saying, truly, this was a son of God who believes he is the son of God. Okay, half of us believe he is the son of God. Who believes Jesus is the son of God that's risen from the dead? Okay, praise God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministered, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar. Among them were Mary Magdalene, <coughs> Mary the mother of James and Joseph, or Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. There were lots of witnesses that day that saw what happened when Jesus shouted his last shout, having finished what he had to do for us. And there was a lot of stuff going on there at that site, that crucifixion site, where Jesus had died for us. Now, can we have image number two, please, Evelina? So, the one veil is torn in two. Do we have another veil? And is it open? Just look at that while I'll be commenting on that in a moment. But take all this in. And when you take communion today, this is what you're celebrating. There's nothing about your situation that he hasn't paid for. And we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be lifting veils this morning. Let's have a look at this one. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. His flesh is the veil of heaven and it's open. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's from Hebrews 10. So God has given us his son to enter the holiest of all, which is the real heaven, the type of which the first veil was just prophesying and they were doing what they could do under the law. But then Jesus came and he fulfilled all of that law. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. My paraphrase. He came to fulfill what they could never truly get fully right under the law of Moses. I mean, Ten Commandments is enough, but they had so many more. And under that law, if you disobeyed one, then you may as well be guilty of the whole lot. Praise God. When you look at that, it's nice to look at a picture. Sometimes they have Jesus on a cross and they have maybe one or two spots of blood. Have you seen those pictures? Right. I want to tell you, and I might even read that out. Thanks, Lord. I want to tell you what he really looked like. But behold, my servant shall deal prudently, Isaiah 52, verse 13. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage, his image, was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. 
For what had not been told, they shall see him. And what had not, they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report? 53 now. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness when we see him. There is no beauty in him that we should desire him. I believe that's relating to this picture, not his normal appearance. I've, I've seen him. And this picture, this Calvary picture, that lashing, that crucifixion of our Lord, our veil into heaven is open. But there would be no clean lines on that body, all ripped to shreds. And he was, he was punished. God allowed him to be punished more than any other man. As far as the Roman flogging and everything goes, they put everything into it because God wanted them to. He spared nothing for you and me. He spared nothing. It's all paid for and it's all free. But we have to believe. Praise God. Just bear with me. I want to keep my train of thought here. Yeah. We're going to look at another type of veil now. Item three, or image three. Can you make that out? Can we shrink it maybe, or what makes it more dense? Can you, you can see that at the back? Yeah. This is our brother Saul, well, Paul. But this is just after he'd been on the road to Damascus. And these images, that's, that's an image of Ananias praying for him. Please look at that picture while you say, Lord, maybe my eyes need to be unveiled as well. I need to see you as you really are in my life. And so I'm going to read while you look at that picture. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes opened, he saw no one. He was blind, blinded. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. The very city he was going to hunt Christians is now the city where he is getting a new life quite dramatically. And he was three days without sight and ate neither neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, <clears throat> and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias, pretty clear vision, coming in and putting his hand on him so that he, so that he might receive his sight. Just a moment. <coughs> 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 
Verse 13, Acts 9. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. <coughs> Sorry. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. If I was in Ananias's shoes, I don't think I'd be too keen, would you? <laughs> this, this man who was the arch enemy of God and his people is now the one you're sent to pray for. Put yourself in Ananias's picture. What's his life like right now? A bit like me when I first walked out here. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. That meant he wasn't going back to Judaism. He wasn't going back to being a Pharisee. He wasn't going back to be the enemy of the Christians. He was in full, fully in to the kingdom of God, fully um, obedient to and committed to our Lord Jesus Christ. He was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed, saying, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul <clears throat> increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that he is Jesus, the Christ. Can we just maybe look to heaven and pray this prayer? Lord, out loud, <laughs> Lord, if I have been blinded to you, in any way, whether by religion or grief or other means, by mankind or by Satan, I ask you to release me now and lift off the veil of blindness to my eyes and my mind. Lift off that religion from me, Lord. Unveil my mind that I may see you as you really are, like Saul did. Amen. Praise God. Veils are coming off today. We're going to pray a little bit later again. But let's go to image number four, Evelina. In 2 Corinthians 3, this isn't the scripture that you might think of, because here is an artistic depiction of a man, of Peter, saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He got that revelation from whom? From the Father. He heard God in his heart so i say to you his heart was unveiled by god the father so that he could see jesus as who he really is these were jewish people they had been faithful to him they'd been with him along the shores of galilee the, in the in the towns the cities and here they were and he's asking them a question who does men say that i the son of man am some said like elijah one of the prophets etc but um, then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And that's my question to you. 
right now. Who do you say that I am? As it says the Lord, Jesus, asking you, who do you say that I am? And Peter, as you know, said, Lord, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. His heart was unveiled. And I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, since we have such... Sorry, yeah, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart to all the Jews. Pray for them. Come off them. Let the veil come off them. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil, both the mind and the heart, is taken away. May it be so to us, to Lord, Lord, today. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Amen. Amen. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Raph, you are being transformed from glory to glory into the very image that God has for you in Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll get on to that later on maybe. <laughs> Bless you, mate. Praise God. We've, we're not going to go to the next one just yet. <laughs> Okay, leave it there. I want you to look at Peter for a while. I'm just going to pray for some people. Surprise, surprise. Helen, the Lord showed me you last Wednesday. And he said, um, he's lifting off a veil. And I believe some of that veil is grief. And um, it's grief and stress. And it's... Um, it's affecting your like, train of thought, your thoughts. God said us to do this. All right? We lift off the veil in Jesus' name. Okay? That's symbolic. But agree with the fact that Jesus has lifted the veil off your mind and you're going to have good experiences with God. And I've got another surprise for you. You two are going to be working together. But you know how we talked about you developing a new skill? or going back to something and you talked about art, you're going to be a pop-up artist in the streets like Victor, wherever. Get yourself, get some art practice, then get yourself a um, very portable easel. That might be your job, Mr Carpenter, now. <laughs> We're losing new, using new skills because the brain will grow new cells as you use new skills. Even something you used to do a long time ago, if you start doing something different, um, it's called neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. The grain is not static, it can be changed. We have the mind of Christ, which is another issue, that's the mind of Christ, the presence of God to help us use this brain. But you'll be out in the streets and you'll be a magnet because who doesn't like to inquire and have a look at what the artist is painting? And you too will be, it's more than evangelism. I think it's, it's ambassadorship, heaven's ambassadors on wherever you're going to go, whether you pick a spot in a parkland or you pick a spot on this. I actually saw you near uh, <coughs> between the cafe and rivers and you were pretending, sorry, <laughs> you, were, you were actually painting the building over the road, but you position your chair and you, John, uh, so that people can have a peek and strike up a conversation, all right? And all you do is tell them what you do, and you just, your testimony is your evangelism, your testimony. 
is your evangelism, your love for God that you feel. And why do you paint? Because I get joy out of it. So pop-up evangelism through artwork. Maybe the carpentry guy can make the um, very portable light. Grab yourself a fold-up chair and off you go. All right? Bless you. Not me, not me. He's my husband. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't go into details. <laughs> Last Thursday morning, I woke up, my love, after a dream where I saw you so young and more beautiful than you've ever been able to be photographed before. And you were wearing tomato red, a jumper, your face was glowing, and I mean glowing. And uh, you, you looked about 30. Now, this may be over the top to you. That's all right. Just call me OTT, because I learned that phrase from my brother. <laughs> I believe this, we haven't even touched the outpouring of God yet. This is a new era where we must allow God to stretch us and stop us from being limited in our thinking. But I believe God's going to rejuvenate your body. That's a short story. But to me, you look about 30. And the whole thing about that is that God has given you a new beginning. As you spend time in the Lord, soaking in his presence, you'll find that the restrictions of old will go away. The mantle of the teacher is now being lifted off. The mantle of God's daughter who has no problems in the spirit realm. She doesn't have to think about everything and plan everything anymore. She is God's daughter. There's no restrictions at all. You're going to see and hear and understand more clearly than most. And you'll be doing meetings, especially women's meetings. So get ready. Praise God. Keep looking at, who are we looking at? <laughs> Peter. Praise God. My catch cry, catch cry to you has been for a while that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Consider that verse well. Don't have a foot in both camps. I don't, I don't mean sin, folks. I just mean spiritual coverings. There is a law, there is an entity called the law of, the, of sin and death. And there's another law which Jesus has made the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free. So I believe that all that is under the curse, we can get out from under it to a large degree, <clears throat> excuse me, by looking into and accepting the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Praise God for children. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, Earth has so many beautiful illustrations of our relationship with God and our current and future walk with him. And when you see this one, you'll, illust you'll find out what veil I'm talking about. Let's have number five. Are we up to number five? Yes. Yep. Now, there's number five there. There should be five images. Ah, we got it. So I was still looking at Saul last time I looked. There's your surprise there, Raph and Denise. Um, it's all printed on the thing, but I got permission from Alice and Bryce to use one of their wedding photos as an illustration for the bride of Christ. Who knows that we... The, the groom lifts off the veil off his, off his bride. And this is a time and a season when God is lifting the veil 
of the hearts that he's preparing, of the minds that he's renewing, and he's changing us from day to day so that we can be like this lovely couple married a short time ago here. When you see that in full um, pixels, it's a beautiful photo. The smiles are just radiant, and God is just doing something wonderful there. So I'm going to read to you a scripture out of Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her it has been granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. That was an angel talking to John. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'll, show you, I'll send you these photos, Reverend Denise later can we go back to image number two Evelina is that okay Jesus on the cross yep Let us pray. Let's pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you as I take communion, knowing that you were marred more than that man is in that picture, that anything that had to be done to save me, heal me, deliver me, and fill me with your presence, you paid the price for you have not abandoned me you have set me free for by your stripes lord i am healed lift off the veil of unbelief religiosity and fear and false counsel from professionals and help me to receive the healing you paid for. Image number five. We're still praying. Lord, lift off the veil from my heart my eyes, my mind. Help me to be prepared as a bride prepares herself that I may be in your marriage supper of the Lamb. In Jesus' name. Those who are organised to take the communion around, would you do that, do that now, please? Oh, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Maurice. I might grab some. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Those two pictures were used for communion. Jesus on the cross and this one. What a productive use of our faith to focus like that on the reality of what we're doing now. It's actually very significant. It's not just a ceremony or a thing we do in church. 
it's a very important way to remember. Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me. And it is written, I just lost the reference in my Bible scholars can tell me, but um, I think it's in Luke where he talks about for many are sick, my paraphrase, not discerning the Lord's body. That body that we saw first paid the price. Name your disease, it's been paid for. Name your sickness, your ailment, your aches, your pains, been paid for. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Still going. Ah, I'm just going to ambush because I was looking for him earlier. He's hiding. Young, young Dave. I saw him on Wednesday too. Is that? No, it's not Dave. <laughs> not Dave. Not even like Dave. Sorry. False alarm. Thank you, Jesus. As often as we do this, the communion, as often as we think about Jesus, as often as we sing to him like we did this morning, we pray, we're helping him to take off anything that's come upon us during the day or through uh, substance abuse or being violated as a person or anything like that. Look to Jesus. He will set you free. Look to him more often and he will set you freer. They're just taking some out the back there. Can we stand together, please? Can we make this statement? Look at the emblems, the body and the blood of Jesus represented here. And say this scripture. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now please take communion and I'll hand back to Mark Britner when he's finished. <laughs> Uh, blows off, wind up, keep going, we're done. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Praise God. I'm releasing you right now. Just know that God's unveiling you this year more than ever before. He's been doing it for, we're in our seventh month now, and he's about to do more in your life. He'll take the veil off, including sickness and disease, because that comes under the curse. So that will help you, I believe, in Jesus' name. God bless you, and enjoy your lunch. There's a heap out there. Enjoy your fellowship.